Disclaimer, if you're joining the Champagne Comedy Podcast for the first time, thank you and welcome. Now, here's a catch-up on what this podcast is all about. July 1992, a comedy show came on. It was on the ABC. What could go wrong? A bunch of degenerates. At 10pm, that's fine. It was called The Late Show, now a product of its time. 50 bucks, what we need, flummoxed and there's more. Things us walks will never do. Would finish donuts. Oh. Bad hat, bad hat. Naughty sleep, Dorian. Robbie's done we. Fellas, fellas. Language, please. It's champagne comedy. News desk, Mark Ray King, Shirty, the slightly aggressive bear. Lou into Luigi and Connie Capriccio's hair. Australians all let us rejoice for we wear tightly jeans. Make love to her like a tiger while we all wear ski V's. I could go on and on and on and I will. But these moments when you quit the show and you get glares from hell. Cause it's a product of its time. I swear I mean no offence. A product of its time. You don't get the reference. A product of its time. Just watch the best bits. Then you'll see A product of its time You'll get the joke Just like me Pleasing all the water keys With a toilet break Countdown classics With Jane and Tom With Molly's Upton Take Accidentally was released Commercial Crime Stoppers 2 There's Graham and the Colonel And Charlie We Love You Booney, dead set legend. Damn, I'm still in Glen Rowan. Yes, I do. Looks like a Logie. And there's something for Church going. Body of Christ. That would be nice. Once there was a time and place when this show was in your face. We watch our bootlegs to soothe the knees and make this podcast with a name to please. There never will be a full release as this show is a timepiece. For everyone who is a fan, this podcast is their plan cause it's a product of its time. I swear I mean no offence. A product of its time. You don't get the reference. A product of its time. Just watch the best bits and you'll see. A product of its time. You'll get the joke just like me. There's plenty of quotes yet to come, so this is what I've gone and done. Here's a breakdown with some cuts where you can go f*** us. We're still number four. <laughs> Opinion noted. A product of its time. I swear I mean no offence. A product of its time. You don't get the reference. A product of its time. Just watch the best bits and you'll see. A product of its time. You'll get the joke just like me. I don't know. I think I... <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Los Indios Tabarajas. I've said that wrong for the theme. And welcome to episode 10 of the Champagne Comedy Podcast, where we talk about the best Australian comedy show from the 90s ever made, The Late Show, and other degeneration comedy tidbits. My name is Matt, and joining this podcast today is in alphabetical order Alison, Daniel, Kim, and Prue. Hi. And. We also have a very special guest, uh, host of the Eurovision Wind Machine podcast, Eurovision Hub, and the voiceover artist, and somehow connected to a pink ostrich on Channel 9, it's Danny Trigoning. We finally have a second uh, extra special guest. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, just don't cash the check yet, okay, please. Okay, I won't, I yeah, promise. Do it after this. <laughs> How are you, Danny? Oh, it's, it's good. It's lovely to be here. It's it's um, it's been very interesting this week going back to 1992, and yes, it is a product of its time. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sorry for torturing your ears, everyone, with that. That started off as a little sting uh, in prep for this show, and then it led into that. So. Sorry about that. <laughs> it just got bigger and bigger. Yeah. You had, to get, you had to get all of that creativity out of your system. Oh, I did. And you know what? The one thing that I originally created it for, I didn't have it loaded in the system for this episode. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I have it for the next episode, so to speak. So um, thank you. And, uh, yeah, this is the first episode for 2021. So thank you, Alice and Daniel, Kim and Prue, for coming back as well. 
And uh, we also will have Tony um, back, our movie reviewer um, specialist as well, coming in future episodes. So we haven't forgotten about him. Thanks to all our listeners. We've reached a major milestone with downloads, which is great. So thank you. And also the ones who want to be part of our show too, we've actually had people who have been part of audience uh, members as well and people who have been either extras or behind the scenes. So they've voiced their expression. So um, I'm... Because there's actually a, quite a few of them, I'm going to put together a special podcast down the track. So if you're listening um, and I've already responded to you, yep, your moment to be in the spotlight will be coming down the track. So that would be a great one. So make sure you subscribe. Yeah, looking forward to hearing about people's experiences. Yeah, this is what we ask yeah. for. And yeah, absolutely. Out, yeah. Remember when I thought they were mythical people? <laughs> <laughs> These, these yeah. are really people who rang that number on Monday morning at 10 a.m. Yeah. We thought that the letters were all fake. We thought everything was just made up. Oh, they actually exist. <laughs> That's a, a big thing coming up, and I do have a little special coming up in um, the later bit of the Champagne Comedy Podcast. So I can't say any more other than I've managed to track down all four of them, but two of them have so far confirmed a yes. That's all I'm saying. There's some sizzle for you. Um, Now that we're back, uh, we're going to discuss in this episode, Season 1, Episode 10 of The Late Show, and now we'll go straight into Daniel. Do you have a program guide at all? Uh, Yes, I do. So this is what was up against Season 1, Episode 10, essentially a plethora of movies. So on Channel 7, we had Stakeout, a 1986 action comedy. Um, According to Ross Warnicke, who would review uh, the TV... That's the very one, thanks. <laughs> so uh, in the Saturday age, he would uh, put his own comments alongside the uh, program guide for the weekend. Yes, yeah, stake out on Channel 7. Uh, he says, Richard Dreyfus and Emilio Estevez are cops staking out the home of an escaped cop killer's ex-girlfriend. Dreyfus falls for the girl, played by Madeline Stowe. It's mildly entertaining, but Dreyfus and Estevez don't work well together. Then on Channel 9, early in the night, we've got Hey Hey, It's Saturday. According to the Green Guide, yeah, I know, I know. I'm not not saying this just because of our guest. You can if you want. Oh, well, I think think it's it's kind of interesting sort of seeing what's on Hey Hey that night as well because that's sort of, I suppose it's kind of the two bookends of the night, Hey Hey and The Late Show. Yeah. So uh, according to the Green Guide, uh, the guests uh, included Clive Young, Can Tutor, uh, actor Henry Sepps, and some band called Things of Wood and Stone. Oh. oh. <laughs> Perhaps that they were performing the song uh, Happy Helen Birthday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hang on. Henry Zepps. Oh, oh, so we're talking about the brother from Mother and Son. Yes. Oh, it sounds sure. like. I mean. You're the dentist. I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> the favourite son out of the, uh, the Bear family, yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I haven't done enough research to know what... Clive Young or Henry Steps or Ken Suto would have been plugging. All I'm thinking <laughs> is that maybe Henry was, like he's known to be part of theatre as well, so maybe he was doing yeah. theatre. Yeah. yeah. Could he have been. been a guest judge on uh, Red Faces. I think Mother and Son was still on air around 1992, so that would kind of make sense. Were you there at all, Danny? Were you <laughs> there? Oh, at- no. See, technically I wasn't allowed to be anywhere near the studio floor under the age of 16. Oh, okay. Were you up in the sound booth hiding behind the cups? Yeah, I was hiding behind sets and stuff at that time. So, (laughs) yeah, no, because, you know, um, there was a big secret. Aussie's not real. (gasps) And, of course, (gasps) oh, oh my God, (laughs) know that. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry, I've ruined it all for Oh, me. no. Yeah, like, it's like when I found out Father Christmas didn't exist. And, you know, he didn't <laughs> this year and, and, yeah, I'm well, still getting over it. I know yeah. aggro is real, okay, so please do not ruin aggro for Agro me. is totally real. Yep, I yeah. have that good authority, yeah. yep. Oh. All right, cross okay. up. Sorry, Daniel, as you were. Yeah. Okay, so after Hey Hey, we had the 1984 drama A Passage to India. Close Warnke, directed by the late David Lean. This is a language ad- adaptation of E.M. Forster's 1920s novel about a plain young Englishwoman, played by Judy Davis, who, while visiting India, abhors the snobbery of the English who run the place. 
But she is shaken when, during an excursion to the Malabar Caves, an Indian doctor, played by Victor Banerjee, allegedly rapes her. Oh, jeez. Uh, oh, he, 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 he ends this thing with a fine film. Oh. After, <laughs> after, after mentioning that, that assault tour. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, I would, I, yeah. Let's 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 draw a line under that. You know, it's it's. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give Warnicky um, his own Warnicky. Warnicky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't think he was linking anything against yeah the assault. Anyway, on Channel Ten, we had uh, also from 1984, but not a lot lighter notes. Uh, Ghostbusters. Oh yes. Uh, this spoof of spooky horror films with Dan Aykroyd, Bill Murray, and Harold Ramis as scientists come ghost chasers hide to pursue spectre haunting Sigourney Weaver's Manhattan apartment block was good fun the first five times it was on TV. But the novelty <laughs> is wearing thin. <gasps> Only five times. <laughs> Even back then, it was on repeat constantly. Okay. On SBS, we've got the 1933 German comedy Victor and Victoria. Most viewers will know of the 1982 Julie Andrews remake of this gender confusion farce about a hapless female impersonator and the singer whom he persuades to masquerade as a man on the nightclub circuit. But the original was more pleasingly subtle with Herman uh, Thimig and Renate Muller. Then on the ABC, um, leading into the late show, we've got Alexi Sales Stuff at 9.30. Then after the late show at 11pm, we've got Order in the House. Then at midnight, Grandstand Special Weightlifting, the Barcelona <laughs> Challenge 1992. <laughs> And I so wish this would have been commentated by Graham and the Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> I think they would have been anything but fun. <laughs> I was just going to ask, do we happen to know which episode of Alexi Sales stuff it is? Because I happen to have been watching Series 3 recently, and so I can tell you what was in the episode, if you know which one it was. It doesn't say in the guide, but from memory, the premiere was last episode, so this would have been okay. episode 2. So what, what was right. episode two? Well, episode two of Alexi Sales stuff, if you go onto YouTube and then you type in a few moments with Lord William Reese Mogg, you will find <laughs> probably one of my favourite sketches in the whole series of Alexi Sales stuff. Well, we still have a little time to spare before the next programme. So what better way to fill it than a few moments with Lord William Reese Mogg? Sorry about that. The BBC recorded the wrong channel by mistake. But rest assured, it won't happen again. <laughs> oh, so funny. Oh, great. Uh, and, I, and, I, <laughs> and just last of all, after the weightlifting at 1am, Rage with guest programmers, the Beastie Boys. Oh, oh cool. a bit good. What a night. What a wild ride that is. Speaking of which, uh, I believe usually in January, this is when this episode was recorded, January 2021, January is usually countdown uh, classics or the retro month on Rage. But this month they haven't been doing it. They've been holding it off to February. So if you're listening to this in January 2021, watch your program guide for Rage for February and you will see a whole bunch of countdown replays. (laughs) And you're listening to this after that time, just forget everything I said and tough luck you've missed out. (laughs) All right, so here we go with Season 1, Episode 10 of The Late Show, which was broadcast Saturday, September 19 in 1992. And we have a glorious opening, starting with a narration from a gentleman who we can't see his face and describing a step-by-step moment of a couple pulling up from their car, which is billowing smoke, and they go to a telephone booth, which blows up. Camera zooms back and it reveals to be Jeremy Beadle. Well, I bet he wasn't expecting that. That's the line. Seeing that puff of, uh, it looked like dust and debris that uh, the Wrecking Ball Mansion Maker phone box was just, it's its spectacular what you're able to do with explosions these days. Yeah, the effect was great. Yeah. So after the opening titles, we have the opening remarks with Mick and Tony celebrating that they made it to episode 10. Show 10, <laughs> anything can happen. Just like this podcast. <laughs> yeah, double digit. I like the start of this way where everyone, the audience are cheering and you go, settle down, you'll hurt yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and he also says, camera three, love your work. 
(laughs) (laughs) They decided to celebrate by doing gimmicky things like appearing (laughs) or eventually appearing on the main event, you know, with Larry Emder's uh, classic show. And how are we going with our main event gag tally? (laughs) I think we're up to two. (laughs) What, in one episode? Uh, No, no, just this episode so far. Yeah, in one episode, yeah. 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 I think that was mentioned yeah. previously in episode eight or nine. I like how they um, talk about all of the, the, the cliche about how it's all going to go downhill. Uh, my favourite out of the list from the main event is they're talking about releasing a bad comedy rap single. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Man, they're, 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 rap. they're deconstructing the comedy career path, aren't they? And, and they're saying, you know, comedy rap single, which I assume is a reference to Victor and Sveta. And, and, <laughs> oh, of course, yes. <laughs> Fast Their forward. recession rap single. No, no, recession rap was that was different, wasn't it? What what was Victor and Sveta's song? I can't remember now. Also, our our, our new opening theme is not a bad comedy rap single. <laughs> uh, very good one. <laughs> so, recession rap was the rubbery figures. Ah, of uh, course, yes. Yeah, Victor and Sveta. Yeah, Tutti Fruity, I want a Rudy. That was it. <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> I'm a fan mm. of that one. <laughs> this episode saw a few episodes back from Bruce Ruxton receiving a synthesis for a bad comedy rap as well. Now, this is going to be a bit of a deep dive because this is what the teaser was about. Just by chance or coincidence, our guest has arrived, very happy to say it, Hollywood movie star Dolph Lundgren. Oh, wow. oh, <laughs> You're going to dial my number? Your number. Like sure, sure, your number. We'll do that. Boy, now, Larry, don't you look really ordinary tonight compared yeah. to Dolph. <laughs> <laughs> Pleased to meet you, Dolph. You, sir. He's got a hell of a oh. grip. Now, that was from the Chance and Coincidence special that was held during the week on Channel 7. How bizarre. Oh, yes. So what was it? It was pretty much a two-hour plug for Telecom promoting their $1 for five minutes STD calls. Wow. Oh, my yeah. gosh. <laughs> yeah, and Dolph Lundgren was in town to uh, promote Universal Soldier. So he was there, he was the lucky one to press the mouse button for a number to generate and the telestrip or the telecom people, it was telecom at the time, would call up the number and then whoever answers the phone needs to say one dollar for five minutes. And if they don't, um, then they move on to the next caller. But the person who actually picked up the phone wasn't even watching the show. And Larry just guided. <laughs> they guided the winner. <laughs> After that, Dolph hit the mouse button again because the it would come up with a generator, kind of like the Chuklotto type bad computer generated thing. And yeah. if their phone number came up on the screen, out of all the numbers that they had in the system, they would win a million dollars. But they didn't win, <laughs> and they won two. They won, yeah, they won uh, two Subaru cars. <laughs> oh, hilarious! I thought you were going to say they were going to get like a you know a telecom phone card or something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Money or what's, what's... a telecom phone card. Well, I will have to say, uh, all the entire show was all about uh, Channel 7 personalities telling stories about chance and coincidence. And so it was pretty much like those urban legends type thing. And I've picked out one certain Channel 7 talent in particular. This is one person. Guess who this person is? There's not too many songs about coincidences, but by chance and coincidence, he's one from Liza Minnelli. Chance events have helped to shape many great movies. And one of the movie land's greatest chance meetings was summed up in one of the great lines in one of the great movies, Casablanca, spoken by Humphrey Bogart. He referred to chance and coincidence intruding into his life. Remember these immortal words? Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. In all of the gin joints, in all of the towns, in all of the world, she has to walk into mine. Great line. Quite incredible stories, eh? No wonder when you tell one of these stories, it causes arguments. A little frock kid. Yeah. He doesn't understand what he's saying, does he? <laughs> like, he's just, he's just saying some words that are on a piece of paper and he's just reading them out. <laughs> what a massive slab of script he was given. Like, it's insane. Yeah. The fact that he said that, uh, I guess, out of all the gin joints, quoting Casablanca, <laughs> what a fantastic line. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's one that, that Matthew knows, obviously, being a little kid. <laughs> yeah. 
He's only like everybody's saying that line in the schoolyard. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I only highlighted that because it is a little fat kid from Hey Dad and you know, the late show always had a running joke around him. So Yeah. That was directly from the Flemish Dog collection, so I've got to give credit to him. You can watch the whole two hour ordeal with the original <laughs> commercials still in the video on on the internet archive uh, courtesy of Flemish Dog. There's a lot of different facets to this special. It's all of the stories about chance and coincidence, but there's also like kind of discussion that's interspersed throughout. There's a, the, the competition that he's part of uh, where they're looking for, it was like Australia's most coincidental face or something like that. Like people had to submit photos comparing themselves to identikit drawings that were an issue of TV week yeah. um, in order to win a car. What is yeah. this identikit <laughs> thing? Like, wow, I just can't wrap my head around yeah. it. Yeah, I, I yeah. need to watch this special now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is it is truly craptastic, as uh, as Flemish Dog says. <laughs> yeah. After the chance and coincidence that Mick just happened to watch it, uh, the controversial photos of the royal family showing Fergie and Diana, product of its time, uh, enjoying time with the family. So, uh, yeah. Um, that's where the sting would have come in handy. Instead, I'd have to make the bloody song. Um, <clears throat> So and, and I've heard he gets called a barjass as well. In, yes. Yeah. Actually, they use the term barjass quite a lot in the first series of the Late Show, don't they? Uh-huh. As just a, a sort of derogatory term for fat people or overweight people. So. All right. So we've also got Hitler footage uh, allegedly posing with Soviet soldiers at the end of the war. His body, that is, with the Jonathan Coleman pose. You know the <laughs> point and smile, and uh, Tony and Mick d- do an impression of Nirvana at the MTV Awards. Now, with this impression, now it all makes sense. Where there's that little montage of where they're jumping yeah. in the background, you can simply YouTube the clip because it's all on YouTube. Although Tony gets it slightly wrong, which I can kind of forgive because I mean this is all in a pre-YouTube, pre-PVR. So is that uh, sort of thing? Is this pedantry? Uh, I'm I'm, I'm going to give Tony the benefit of the doubt because, I mean, back in those days, unless you actually taped it on actual tape, you probably, like, wouldn't remember that it was actually... It was Dave Grohl saying into the mic, Hi, Axel. Hi, Axel. Not are you there, Axel. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that is a case. Play that again, Matt. (laughs) Yeah, go on. I I deserve it, I suppose. (laughs) All right, now we have the news desk with Tommy G, and let me go through the bullet points very quickly. So we have, and this is all a product of its time, uh, Pakistani wins Stupid Beret of the Year Award, where it shows a photo of someone wearing a stupid beret. Uh, Buckingham Palace denies ostracising Fergie, and a sign saying, keep out, that means you, barjass. Uh, New Guinea <laughs> PM promises to hit back at rebels who stole his moustache. And West Coast Eagles gear up for the AFL Grand Final Parade and it shows footage of Army soldiers. So, next bit is Tony and Mick continue their Nirvana impression and interrupt Tommy G by jumping up and down in the background, which (laughs) is now uh, immortalised on the DVD. So now we all know what that bit was about. Yep. Um, It does look quite a lot like the real footage, to be fair to them. They've, They've done a good job of recreating it. Yeah. Don't believe everything you read, man. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the origins of QAnon there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, large ravage Pakistan uh, and a family escape using a large wok, but their neighbours weren't so lucky <laughs> using a colander. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, hold on, I've got to load this up. To the dish. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. To be That's fair, what that it, does, it does look like a wok. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It, it, it is a massive, massive walk that you would use to feed your entire village. Uh, the Thailand general elections. Uh, now, this is really uh, hard to pronounce. Uh, Sham Long Shiri Young. I wrote it out phonetically too, and I still screwed it up. Uh, lost as people <laughs> couldn't spell or say his name. Well, there you go. That's just a proven point. <laughs> yep. Yes, <laughs> Space Shuttle Endeavour orbiting Earth as part of NASA's 50th space launch. This is 1992. A number of experiments to be done are can frogs spawn in orbit, what to do with your overdue video rentals, and are aerobics classes just as annoying without gravity? And also, the Endeavour had its first married couple, Mark, Santo, and Jane. Jane, with that constant leaning to the panel with a camera on the side, 
pretending to be in space. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed this because they, they sort of do kind of very cliched kind of married couple arguments like, you know, no, you're driving too fast. No, I'm not, you know, and all this. And then, then they have an argument about renovating the bathroom, which is which is like very sort of typical cliched mar- married couple stuff. So that was quite fun, I thought. Yeah, it was quite funny when the lead in, lead in was actually Tom asking, "So, you know, in space, have you been able to do that?" And, the, and then they, and then you think they're going to say something else, and they're like, "Oh, yes, yes, you can absolutely renovate a bathroom yeah. in space, <laughs> and you can you can definitely bicker in space." Oh yeah, Victoria government preserved Ned Kelly's alleged last home. Uh, they could tell because of the helmet <laughs> hat stand in the porch. That's a bit of a visual joke yeah. there. And we have footage of Hitler's body released. Uh, evidence of Hitler's one brass ball is the proof. <laughs> <laughs> Visual joke there. And in Monaco, uh, to commemorate the anniversary of the death of Princess Grace, who also died in a car accident, uh, coincidentally the anniversary falls the same week of her daughter, Stephanie, losing a licence. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. Such, a, such a slow burn groan from the audience. Yep. Yeah. Tommy knew it. And I did he... like the way Tommy G did the Vizard uh, drum movement with his hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one, two, three. Matt, you have forgotten the John Major sketch with um with Rob as John Major. Yeah. Desk. Uh, oh yes, talk to Teddy. Do you want to explain the John Major sketch? Yeah, well, there was a there was a financial crash in the UK in 1992, and my husband's British, and I said to him, "Do you remember the financial crash in 1992 and what caused it?" And he said, "Yeah, it was something to do with interest rates." Now he he doesn't really listen to this podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> That's the understand. right thing to say. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't understand our obsession with interest rates, and I actually googled <laughs> this recession, and I found that indeed it had something to do with interest rates. So everything in the early 90s is all about interest rates. I enjoyed this sketch. I like it because John Major basically doesn't want to come and speak to Tommy G. He hides under the desk and he says, you'll have to talk to Teddy, and Teddy appears um, on the desk. And then, then Tommy G says, well, can we speak to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, Mr Norman Lamont? And, and Norman Lamont, he, he doesn't want to speak either, so he puts his toy up and, and then and then it sort of goes on. There's another politician involved who also doesn't want to speak and puts his toy up. So it, it's I think this is quite a good sketch and it doesn't go on for very long, but it's quite punchy. So, yeah. Looking yeah. At Be careful of mentioning interest rates and building societies, right? <laughs> they are banned from this podcast. Yeah. Isn't that right, Daniel? <laughs> oh, look, nothing that we say should be considered financial advice. Bit of background for, for Danny. Uh, yes, someone basically contacted us and said, well, the reason why interest rates were very, mortgage rates are high is because interest rates are high. And oh, this, and we're like, ah, please. It's yeah. like, yeah, thank you very much for the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's because I, I, I flippantly said that, like, I, I, I would love to have a high interest savings rate these days compared to 1992. And, yeah, it was reminded that, yeah, if it was a high, high interest rate in a savings account, it would also mean high mortgages. Oh, and it went downhill right. from there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People who know more about this wrote to us, and that was interesting, and thank you very much. Yeah, we were just testing to see if they were listening. Yeah. 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 So, and they were. Yeah. Yes, they were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we have uh, the public leaders gathered together to speak world peace, which had the Dalai Lama, the Israeli PM, and Nirvana. Yep. And the... Bureau of Meteorology were hit with industrial action, only allowed to give limited weather updates with Tommy G showing tomorrow's weather, which had vague descriptions. So visual, I think that the audience couldn't keep up reading it because it just got stony silence. Yeah. Yes. A lot of those got that in the news desk, didn't they? It was, wasn't was just <laughs> awkward I didn't get it. It was like... Oh, God, what what have you done, Tommy? <laughs> my, my observation after watching 10 weeks of, of Tommy G's news desk is that he has quite a high failure rate on the news desk. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like but he, he gets knocked down and he gets back up again. It does yeah, he does. He, he leans into the crap jokes and just yeah. kind of takes them as far as they possibly can go, which I quite admire. I want to make notice of the fact that uh, at the top of the news desk there's another... He, someone had his moustache stolen joke. That is like either it's Tommy G or the entire degeneration, but they love a moustache stolen joke. Like, yeah. 
There's a tally for that and the main event gags. We need a whiteboard, people. That's what oh, we yeah. But you know what? This is the first episode that the news desk only appears once, which is at the start. So there you go, mm-hmm. Alison. Or was yeah. that you, Drew, who mentioned Good that? observation. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, Tommy oh. Drew doesn't have any glasses on. No, I wrote doesn't. that down. Yeah, I wrote that down as well. <laughs> <laughs> observation. Early also... days of looking old, yeah. Yes. Was he wearing contacts? <laughs> uh, we're doing well. We're doing well. All right. Uh, now, uh, also, that graphic that uh, ends the news desk, um, I won't read all of it out. Basically, it lists yeah, very vague descriptions for each city. But I, I did like the description for Melbourne. Let's see you make sense of the squiggly lines now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They're good at their weather gags. So now we have a sketch, and this one fell a bit flat, but I've, I found it funny. I think the audience just didn't get it, and that was the True Blue petrol station commercial with uh, Jason as the car serviceman and Jane as the customer, and it just had all the cliches you would get with a car mechanic and petrol station type thing. A lot of visual stuff with a clever jingle, but it just went nowhere, to be honest. Uh, there was a nice line at the end, we're true blue, we're Aussie with American owners. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm also wondering whether it might have been making a reference to a petrol station ad that might have been out in the wild back then. Ampol? I, I'm thinking it might have been Amp. Yeah, I'm thinking Ampol as well because I'm sure mm. they had a jingle that went, I'm as Australian as Ampol. Actually, tying into uh, modern times because <laughs> um, Ampol became Caltex and then now it's going back to being Ampol again. This is all reminding me of how I used to think that BP was an Australian company because it had the green and gold colours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the definition of British petroleum didn't tip you off? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Not even when I saw it in an episode of The Goodies, I'm like, oh, they've got BP too. <laughs> that was Baden Powell, though. <laughs> it only had just the, the one uh, good joke in there, which was, yeah, Jason getting something out from Jane's car. It's making a funny noise. Oh, there's the problem. Cat caught in the fan belt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. They they do like a squashed animal gag. In fact, I think we get a few more of them later in another sketch. Yes, we do, yeah. The next sketch is, a, well, it's not really a sketch. It's just a bit of a get-together with uh, talking about the chess match of the century between Boris Spassky and Bobby Fischer with chess expert Roger Pelmet, which is Rob, having a chat to Tony, uh, breaking down the chess tournament. Brilliant! Yeah. Wow, what a uh, little nugget of gold this one is. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that because it's Rob and Tony, but yes, it's Rob and Tony. <laughs> Pretty much Rob shouting at Tony. Yeah. <laughs> and Tony laughing at him, actually. <laughs> yep. To slightly ruin the sketch, it, it basically transpires that Roger Pelmet doesn't know a great deal about chess, really, and he starts introducing, when he describes the chess match, he starts introducing... Um, pieces from other board games so suddenly there's a hotel on one of the squares from monopoly and and suddenly there's a and one of the knights takes professor plum who of course is from cluedo and it and it goes on and on until it gets pretty ridiculous and introducing um ninja turtles and then Mm -hmm. he he does the sort of Australian cough thing where you sort of cough violently and, and your arms fly across the board and you just <laughs> everything from the board. And, oh no, you've got to start again, which is, which is what you do when you're losing. Um, <laughs> so I, I like the way this escalates and becomes sillier and sillier and then just kind of explodes at the end. So it's, it's a good fun. Yeah, you've just found it. My brilliant, favorite, brilliant, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant description. My favorite bit in it was when uh, Rob goes, uh, Spassky panicked, and uh, so did I, because he's just <laughs> holding the, the script or something, and he's just like going, what do I do next? <laughs> yeah, and that's a very Graham and the Colonel joke, isn't it, where they, they sort of break the fourth wall. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Oh, guess what time it's for? <laughs> And that Yay. is episode 10 Yay. of the olden days. And that is Front Bottom La Stupenda. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, La I'm Stupenda, sorry. by the way. Yeah, La Stupenda, by the way, was the, the name that Joan Sutherland was given in, in Italian opera circles. She was called La Stupenda because she was stupendous at her opera singing. <laughs> so, yeah. ah. the reference. Oh, okay. Well, I thought it was uh, something else totally different, saying that he was uh, completely well, stupid. Stupid does sound stupid, doesn't it? But, yeah. but actually, in, in Italian, it, it means a really good thing. It means you're brilliant. So. Oh. 
I really thought that it made it sound like from bottoms away. Let's do the irony of it. Be quiet. <laughs> oh, that's that's just an, an excellent gag there, and I don't know how they, they they came up with it from. Like, obviously, I think they must have been watching old these old episodes of Rush with the sound off, and yeah, just trying to work out what what they would do to footage of Governor Frontbottom yeah, walking around the room, then opening the door, saying something, and quickly closing it. <laughs> Danny, you're an expert at music, especially Eurovision. Yes. Now, what would you think that would be suited for, well, I guess, South Pacific type thing, like, a say, something that front and bottom would do? Oh. I've really put you on the spot. I'm sorry for this. You have put me on the spot, yeah. <laughs> what do you think he would oh. be suited for? Like, uh, what country, really? Like, Swede- would he be good Swedish? Would he be no, good? No, no, front bottom definitely wouldn't be Sweden. He's He's not... He's not polished enough. Um, maybe maybe uh, uh, Poland or maybe a bit of North Macedonia. I reckon he'd do all right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not Sweden. So, oh, no. okay. All right. So he would sit we'll into the Polish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah the, the one thing that I think is missing from Eurovision contestants is is a certain punsiness. You know, <laughs> you, get, you get camp, you get openly gay, but you don't get punsy, and that that is the quality that that front bottom brings to his you know prof- performance style. Let's just say that. Well, we're in the middle of national final season, which is very exciting, and you get to kind of learn all of these acts that just never really make it anywhere. So there may be some good quality punsy ones <laughs> okay. within national finals that don't actually get to Eurovision. But, yeah, I'll keep an eye mm. on oh, Inspired by a front bottom, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> do, do also let us know, Danny, uh, if there are any bell bottoms uh, in oh, any yeah. of the uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. So the next part after the olden days is... Viewing number one, because he appears in a couple of times, uh, Shirty refuses to get ready with the children for playtime, so he does the most violent thing ever, and uh, he shoots him off screen. <laughs> Doesn't Jane literally say he's not always killing the children? Like, as if <laughs> he's just constantly gunning down small children, and, and that's fine, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> At least he surrendered his weapons. That's true. <laughs> So, yeah, after that little violent little uh, shirty, we have Shit Scared and Rob and Mick are in studio with Tom. And after Rob discovers the audience has been laughing at their stunts, he decides to <laughs> come in and set the record straight. It's like, hey, we're, we're serious. Don't make fun of us. And uh, especially after... I love this bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, like, uh, I love the bit where Rob goes, so I thought he was uh, going to load the, the clay pigeon trap, but uh, no, he obviously and predictably shot my head off. <laughs> <laughs> predictably. <laughs> and then he had uh, 47 operations. <laughs> and, of course, the punchline is he uh, gets uh, plastic surgery to make him look like Bruno Lucia. <laughs> Good on Bruno Lucia for coming in, in and doing this, by the way. I, <laughs> I, I actually tried to reach out to Bruno during the week and uh, for, for one thing and then I was going to include the, this podcast, but I didn't hear back, only from his agent. And uh, I did get a missed call from an unknown number, but I don't know if it was his or not. So <laughs> I tried to get him for this one bit, just a little, What? how did you feel? But, yeah, sorry, Bruno, feel free to reach out and you can backtrack, okay? Did you, did, did you also ask Bruno's reps uh, whether he could say chicky babe? <laughs> so the issue of TV Week that featured Bruno, was that also uh, the issue that may have been used in the identity kit <laughs> things oh, that we yes. were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so they decided to show footage of an early stunt, which I got a gut feeling uh, that it might have been during the Channel 9 pilot. Yeah. pilot. yeah, I feel like this is... Um, the historical using Jane Suzuki Vitara and getting the 
Hi Eight camera out of the Australia's Funniest Home Video Cabinet. The JVC. Well, also, it's <laughs> definitely the Channel Nine car park. I'm sure. Yeah. You can confirm that is the Channel Nine car park. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And also, I took a big shout out to uh, Tommy's red blazer, which is ridiculous. Oh, <laughs> so I love the blazer. That came from Channel Nine wardrobe. Someone needs to <laughs> do some explaining. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't noticing that because I, I was looking at how long Tom's hair was in that uh, in that sketch. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah not very co- good continuity. <laughs> <laughs> I assume the red jacket was left over from, you know, Graham Kennedy days or, or something. Oh, <laughs> yeah, black and white TV. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, a start of Rob being run over in a car driven by Mick with only half a centimetre's worth of clearance. And unfortunately, nothing goes to plan. Yeah, first of all, the keys get locked in the car. Then uh, the car won't start with Mick having to ask, has anybody got jumper leads? And this is where Tom kept always prompting Rob saying, hey, there's an issue with this. Hey, Rob, hey, Rob, hey, Rob. And then that leads to when they actually do the stunt, Rob lying down, car is about to drive over, and Tom calls Rob out, sits up, bang. All he was trying to say is, oh, I just wanted to wish you good luck. (laughs) (laughs) So first time Tom has caused the problem. (laughs) Okay, now we have time for Countdown Classics and... This is where Eurovision entries would suit. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's all yeah. about trousers. There's some great trousers in this. There's really good ones. I loved this segment. I, was I just bet like, you oh, did. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Here are the culprits, really. So uh, they point out Ray Burgess in leather, Christy Allen in lycra, uh, John St. Peter's in satin, and, oh, the all-together now star, John English. In, oh, my in, God. Yeah. In plain the, the yellow, shopping the yellow pants. pants. The banana pants. They're amazing. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a yellow top as well. In the, So it's like just, just a banana yellow. It was a, match. It was a matching set. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, a beautiful a set complete. <laughs> Hey, when you said Ray Burgess, is that baby Ray Burgess from... Uh... <laughs> What did he do? The Wheel of Fortune? <laughs> uh, I, don't yeah. I, don't, I don't want to see baby John Burgess in leather. I'll just <laughs> oh, head. it's John Burgess. <laughs> I'm mixing the names up. Let's move on. Oh, really? You're actually legit. <laughs> <laughs> People right. did sing a lot about clothes back then. They did, yeah. Because women used to undress skirts, people, so it was a real revolution. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other culprits. Now, this time it's flares. It was Smokey, the band Hush, Dark Tan, and, of course, Molly. So they always mm. have to get to have, get a poker rib against Molly. Yes. And, um, and, also, and the funny thing is that Molly actually looks the best in his pants. I know, right? When he, yeah. he jumps up out yeah. of his couch, he's like, wow, Molly, you look pretty great. <laughs> I also like the um, very silly joke of uh, Jane holding a conversation with her jeans uh, just to segue into the Dr. Hook song, Baby Makes Her Blue Jeans Talk. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to which uh, Tom uh, recounters, uh, pity he couldn't make his eye patch sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a bit, yeah. Uh, and they did uh, play a bit of sky hooks because um, they – Saying all about blue jeans. Yeah, everybody's wearing blue jeans. Don't take oh, a lot of songs about jeans in this uh, Countdown Classics. Mm, but they did, end, yeah. they did end with Marnie Roan with Denim and Lace. The, mm. the song that I only knew at the time that Margaret Bland danced to from Fast Forward. Oh. Well, sorry, yeah, uh, that's Jane Turner. Wait, look up New Faces, Jane Turner, Denim and Lace, and you'll see it right there. That's right. great little dance number. <laughs> the next sketch is Rob Innie Up Back and it's documentary style. Now, this one is very uh, a, a nice ribbing towards all those uh, current affair type things, you know, like Ray Martin, good sort, top blokes type thing. Uh, trying to find a true blue Aussie character. They try to get Percy Kookaburra Dawkins, uh, but he was unavailable as he was filming a piece for a current affair. So they decided to track down Jack Wallaby Peterson instead but he was unavailable too. And out came an unknown man, Tony, who rattles off a few names who may or may not be available. 
Mm. Bazo Wombat O'Grady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that name just really tickled me. And also the bit in it where he says to give him a call on 71717. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's our yeah. favourite number. Yeah. <laughs> this particular sketch, they, they redid it two years later in Frontline. It was one of the B-plots in an episode where they, they wanted to get a kind of zany outback character and yeah. uh, they sent Martin D'Astasio out, out to the outback to find someone and, and the joke in it was that a current affair had got to this zany outback character before Frontline had. Yeah, so- it was, it, it, from, from memory, it was somebody who made sculptures out of animal shit. <laughs> yeah, that was it. That's why, yeah. that's why it felt familiar. Kind of like Wallaby Jack, where yeah. every time we see Wallaby Jack, yeah. it's always the yeah. Russell Coit. I, I, I also like that Rob seems to be doing like it's it's a little bit Mike Morris, but I think it's also probably his best um, uh, George Negus impression as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, he, he certainly got the, the, the sports jacket on, so, yeah. Mm. It's great. It's kind of like the embryo of an idea that we know, you know, jumps yeah. into something else. So it's, yeah. it's a wonderful moment. There's a bit of foreshadowing in this episode. Like there's sort of nods and you go, oh, that's why this this episode was really good because it's like, oh, it's, oh. Yeah, I had a few light bulb moments watching this one. I think we all yeah. do with this stuff. So when we rewatch all these things, we go, holy crap, now that makes sense. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we can see where it came to fruition at least. The next uh, segment is, oh, Sink the Slipper is back. And they have Tony and... Quote, Mick. Uh, but this week's contestant is the mum from Sylvania Waters, Nolene Donoher, the person yeah. who looks Yay. like Nolene Hogan. She, I think she does look like Nolene Hogan. <laughs> she looks an awful lot like her. Yeah. Yes, I have um, <laughs> Sylvania oh Waters God, diary. Yeah. I, I have to admit this was bought, uh, used, I don't know when, probably in the 90s, but I found it um, wow. at my mum's place. But it's um, the Sylvania Waters diary is actually um, Nolene's own story. So it's where she talks about what happened in the background and how the ABC and BBC production started and also talks about the... Um, how she was misrepresented, and it goes through all the episodes and, and discusses um, what how the selective editing process happened and also how she's been getting threats and all this. So it's, it's very her story. Um, I was fiddling around with a the scanner there because there is a page where it's um, around the time of the Sink the Slipper episode where she talks about um, how she was being unfairly edited and the, the picture was so small that I had to actually scan it in so I could zoom in and read what it was saying. Um, but it's, it's quite funny because uh, Laurie, her husband, um, described uh, in the Sunday Telegraph as the patriarch in the re- real-life drama, has slammed the um, ABC and the program's producers for misrepresenting the family. Um, he talks about all the selective editing, um, how they contrast the, his family and, and his kids, his son's kind of less less rich lifestyle i should say they, they, they kind of contrast their lavish home with him and all this sort of thing um then there was this story about laurie who in the past had actually had a dispute with a neighbor and rammed a, a hose down his throat and he was charged with assault um that was 15 years prior to the the sylvania waters so it says here um Donahue admitted yesterday he had been charged with assault after a dispute with a neighbour when the family lived at Mortdale. That's another suburb close to Sylvania Waters. Um, he said he had been threatened and, in defence, had rammed a garden hose down the neighbour's throat, smashing some of his teeth in the process. It was 15 years ago. It goes to show we are quite normal, he said. <laughs> Donahue was charged that is with not assault. Normal. How is that normal? Yeah, and then he says... It's like the worst thing I've ever heard. And then he says... I'm sure anyone in my position would have done exactly the same thing, he said. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm just remembering all yeah. those times that my dad shoved a hose down someone's mouth and broke their teeth. I mean, that was that was a weekly occurrence around my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he goes on yeah. to say they'd been asked to view the series before it was screened but, was, but were turned down. Oh, funny about that. Um, yeah, course, and then yeah. they talked about how they, they're waiting for some someone to make them an offer to make another show that talks about their side of things so yeah that, i had to zoom in to read it because it was literally that small <laughs> so, wow. on the page um, but it's quite an interesting little book it talks has lots of um she's obviously has a very extensive clippings collection 
did she have any regrets at all? Oh yeah, the, the whole sorry. thing's full of full of regrets. Really, um, she 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 says at the end, um, "I'm sorry for any heartbreak I've caused you." And to my stepchildren and my own children, I say one final time that I'm sorry for any heartbreak. Well, that's yes, not, and she uh, did not undertake to do it for notoriety or for gain. It was innocently done, and I say sorry to those I have offended. But um, she talks about a few episodes that she liked as well. Episode 9 was one of her favourite ones because it co- actually covered her many different aspects and of the family and the day-to-day living. Laurie stocking the bar fridge and cleaning the boat, myself and Pat chatting in the kitchen, and Mick building a garage and all of us talking about Paul and Dion's forthcoming wedding. This was more in line with how I expected the show to turn out. Mm. So. Well, mm. and as Daniel has mentioned in the past, in a previous episode, that the Sylvania Waters episodes are on YouTube. So. Uh, just getting back quickly to the Sink the Slipper, um, I like how they, they don't reference her as Nolene Donahue, but just the mum from Sylvania Waters. Yeah. Mm. Kind of like the little fat yeah. kid from Hayden. Yeah. You just you know who you're talking yeah. about. You don't know. The person's name. Did you get the list of who else had submitted some entries to sink the slipper? Uh, well, teen the queens. Yes. <laughs> and and the, the, the people responsible for the Campbell's Cash and Carry adverts, which I think is another reference to um, <laughs> Delilah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't you white folks listen? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to mention as well, uh, just quickly, and we've mentioned this previously when Fairly Arrow came up in an episode. Uh, on my way home um, <laughs> the other day, the Town and Country Hotel where Fairley had staged her kidnapping where she was hiding out is now long gone. So they've, knocked, they've knocked it down now. So there goes that theme park. <laughs> the Fairley Arrow theme park. Yeah, the fa- Fairley <laughs> Arrow theme park, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that, that only got pulled down like about two months ago. Oh, so I just wanted they must to tell have heard you, your podcast. Yeah, I've been itching to tell you ever since the previous episode. All right. Barley Town and Country Hotel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Town and Country Hotel in the rain. All right, so uh, what have we got here? Oh, it's time for... Again, and we have Muffin, the sock puppet, who is back, which is <laughs> Santo. Oh, no, did I just ruin it? Whoops. Just like Tammy done. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Tammy runs down on how a house uh, it needs to be built and Muffin calls Shirty stupid, which uh, then Shirty attacks Muffin with a hammer. Ouch. And uh, at least it wasn't a gun. And uh, who ends up in plaster. <laughs> and Shirty then breaks out the nunchucks, which was the style at the time because of the Teenage Ninja Turtles. Yep. Yeah. Did anybody notice the signatures that were on uh, Muffin's um, plaster? No. no. Ah. Okay. You 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 did have to pause this on the VHS to be honest, but uh, we had Humphrey Bear <laughs> and Fat Cat, <laughs> of course. Ah, yeah. Fat Cat. Yes. And also Basil Brush. Oh. oh gosh. Um, I don't. I I don't yeah. know if he's that well known out of outside of the UK or not. He- uh, in Australia, oh, yeah, we had he was. Yeah. In the 70s, yeah. 80s, yeah. Oh, yeah, loved Basil Brush. What yeah, about Mrs. Cream <laughs> Oh, Can you see that? Yeah, we're screenshotting that and we'll put on Twitter. <laughs> oh, well done. Nice. Yeah, I've got Mr. another screen of the episode there. So. Mr. Mr. Squiggle would surely have signed um, Shirty's cast. Oh, he would have, or- uh, Muffin, <laughs> but he would have gone upside down, upside down. Well, <laughs> yeah. I really love the bit where Shirty go. He's bashed Muffin with the hammer, which is a seriously violent act, and then he just does the happy hands. Oh, hi. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's when I knew that I was going to love Shirty, the slightly aggressive bear, forever. <laughs> yeah. I won't mention it now because it happens at the end of the episode, but it was from there I think... Shirty might have been played by more than one person. So we've always had the oh, assumption yes. other than Rob, but it might be someone else, which kind of would sum it up. But all right, that's a spoiler alert. So don't mention it but yet. But of course anyway. you would. Like yeah. if, you, if you wanted to make a Shirty, you wouldn't be married to the one guy in the suit because you'd be just like, quick, someone who's six foot or something, get in the suit. Yeah, yeah it looks about the same. <laughs> Mm. So, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 see that in the in the closing credits. Yeah. yeah, don't want to steal your spotlight, Daniel. No, no, don't. Cool. <laughs> All 
All right, so the next bit, Tony and Jason are on the couch, and this is more or less a highlights or showreel for Jace to kind of boost up his uh, persona, really, because it's all about Jason's acting career. But he's also impressed with Tony's acting so far. But uh, Jace shows some clips uh, from his time in the fast lane as a cameo walking by in the background. ABC's the fast lane. So he basically pulls like a delivery man number two type thing. Mm. But it's yeah, terrible. It's, 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 expert, it's, it's absolute professional carrying a box in the background, I've got to say. Yeah. It, it's great work. I the, all <laughs> of the fast show is actually oh, sorry, the fast lane is is on YouTube. There's a channel that's got all the episodes and I haven't watched all of them so I can't identify which one has Jason in it, but but maybe there's someone out there who's also watched the fast lane on YouTube who can tell us which one it is. Yeah, I even checked Jason's IMDb and it's not oh. even listed. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that's how <laughs> Uh, yeah, we have to torture ourselves to go through those episodes. We'll do it, so you don't what, need to. What barrier two, I assume, was his character name? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm, su- I'm surprised yeah. that I'm surprised that Tony Martin didn't ty- get to type that into IMDb. IMDb. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't doesn't Tony Martin enter all the IMDb stuff on the side? Oh, he has alluded to that, hasn't he? He he did he did all of New Zealand cinema or something That's right. on IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Get get on to it, Tony, if you're listening. Jace also appeared in the ABC series Home, the kids' show, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, I, lo- I love that show. Yeah. My favourite part of this bit, though, was um, Jace going, Tony, I want to give you a late show cuddle. Daddy, <laughs> 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 <Yeah, laughs> I. Yeah, and this was pre-COVID times and he was still, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, other jokes such as, you know, because of his appearances and that, he's appeared in Farlap, Dances with Wolves. Yeah. So And, and, and his, his own side hustle, uh, riding a horse and cart around Melbourne. <laughs> that too, yeah. Do they still do that in Melbourne? Or not because of COVID, but like before I think that? it's a product of its time. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they do still do it, though, and everyone hates it. Yep. Gotcha. <laughs> Makes right. the city smell like horseshit. <laughs> this is correct. How do you? It's not a Melbourne cliche. <laughs> All right. So we have a next sketch, which is the. Hold on. Let me set the scene. April 17, 1941. The citizens of Yugoslavia wait to a surprise. And it was about. Watch out. Hitler's Hitler's about. about. Watch out. Hitler's about. There's a lot of Hitler jokes in there. In this episode, all right. To be fair, this is this is this is kind of a mild one, really, about Hitler. So we have a toilet break, and Jane introducing the natural seven. You take the high road. Now, wasn't this full of class? Is it? I, I love this. I, I love this Scottish themed um, song. <laughs> they're yeah. all they're all in these ridiculous kilts, and and there's a lovely kind of Scottish scene that they've they've made in the ABC studio, including a papier mâché stone bridge, which it looks like a. <laughs> And on because it would probably collapse if they all went on it. But um, yeah, I thought that would be great. It's exactly the sort of thing like my grandmothers would have loved. Yes, and, and all those beautiful natural seven legs in kilts. Oh mm. yes. Did anyone freeze frame it when the men wore just to make sure they were to see if they were wearing any other? <laughs> no, but what were the results? I couldn't tell. Video quality wasn't that good. No uh, high def. Getting a bit basic instinct here. <laughs> <laughs> some some very rudimentary um, choreography as well. It's sort of they 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 sort of go left and back and then right and sort of do like a it's like a square dance almost. Yeah, I thought it was really daggy co- uh, choreography. It was just like walking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're, they're trying to they're trying to replicate Scottish sort of country dancing, aren't they? Because the women are wearing those those kind of crossover lace up shoes that they wear. Yeah. Scottish dancing, yeah, Morris dancing, yeah, dancing. Yeah, it's not more, it's not more it's dancing. dancing. Now. Yeah, sorry, it's all, all these people from Adelaide here. <laughs> it, it's not dancing, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> It's not yeah, Morris Dunn, that's a weird England thing. Oh, with, yeah, that's right. There's yeah. men with sticks with bells on them and they, they kit the sticks together. It, it, Scottish Dunn is different, but anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to bring it back to our, our guest, Danny, uh, how, how many points 
Do you give it? Do you think it would be Dusplant? Oh, for the toilet break. Oh, yeah. I think I'd probably give it a solid seven. Yeah, it's <laughs> better than average, but nice. it's definitely not Dusplant. Yeah, I think it's a good solid seven from you know jury of one. Yeah, you know if if the UK splits up, you know because Scotland's threatening to leave the UK at some point, which would mean they would have their own um, Eurovision entry then I assume this is the kind of Scottish entry we're going to get in the future. Oh, but I'm, please. I, I'm, I'm also wondering, because, you know, the UK always comes last in Eurovision, and I'm wondering whether Scotland might be a bit more popular in the Eurovision scoring. Who knows? The thing is they split up in junior Eurovision, so England hasn't been in Jesk for quite some time. Mm. And instead we've got Wales, which is great. And it's lovely seeing Wales as its own entity. So, oh, look, I fully support Scotland being their own entity at at Eurovision and Wales because there's been so many amazing Welsh singers, you know, representing the UK. So, yeah, but look, honestly, as long as we don't get anything from Riverdance again, I'll be happy. (laughs) (laughs) How dare you? <laughs> that's my, to be fair, that's Ireland. Yeah, that's Ireland. But you know, still, there's there's some skirts happening. Now, how do I go from that into the smart shopper, which has uh... <laughs> oh, the smart shopper. Oh my god, this is my favourite thing in the entire history of the Late Show. I think it's very good. It's wow. very it's, good. like it's got my favourite line ever, which is, "Are you casting aspersions on the Habibi?" <laughs> <laughs> I just want that made into a, a T-shirt that I can wear everywhere. Well, Daniel had that suggestion of the kind of accidental Partridge-style merchandise where you just have these references from the late show for sale, so that could be a good shirt. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'll put that next to Flummoxed. <laughs> Maybe uh, uh, you're a very beautiful woman. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Mm. Very beautiful. Where's that one at your peril? Yeah, Yeah, that's not a good look in the era of Me Too, is it? No. (laughs) No. Well, yeah. Oh, uh, oh, product of its time, that's definitely going to be a t shirt, I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Jeff and Terry Bailey just completely trying to make Jane lose it, pretty much. And they were losing Mm. it at the same time. (laughs) So I I just love some of the brands, the up and coming brands that they go for, such as the Gomez from (laughs) Portugal. Now, I'm pretty sure this is what he says, so I apologise if it sounds uh, a bit, I mean, no, Reiki, which is the <laughs> chain from China. So, yeah, yeah. product of, yeah. and the O'Shaughnessy from Ireland. <laughs> yeah. It's been and blessed. Yes. yes. So, so, so yeah. that the tape doesn't shoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they went on and on about the Vlodko as well, which changed name about three times. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Which is Ukrainian. It's, it's Ukrainian, the Vladko, isn't it? Yeah. It's well, so that's a masterpiece of Ukrainian technology. Well, it's a masterpiece. Yeah, wood finish. Yeah. It floats. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't the Gomez with the cork finish? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> Gomez had the cork finish and floats, yeah. Yeah. I just love the fact that uh, was the Vladko was a mono unit, but if you want it in stereo, you had to buy two of them. Yeah. <laughs> That's how audio works, yeah. Yeah. And Rob goes, are you paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, the special button. <laughs> <laughs> it's just magic. Yeah, none of them were following their script. They were just going off and tangents. <laughs> you could tell when, you know, the whole Jane is a very beautiful woman. Yeah. yeah that, and they mentioned yeah, that so, when so many times. Gonna... So that's part of the whiteboard count. So we've <laughs> lost count on that, that's for sure. Hey, guess what it's time for? The Spaz family. Yes. Yeah. 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 One of our favourites. And Des angers the family after rewriting all the accordion solos in F sharp. Tension and heartbreak. Oh, my God. <laughs> in the two-part <laughs> Spaz family premiere. Oh, we love the space. <laughs> that really made me laugh. That line, he rewrites all the accordion solos in F chart. Like, what a classic! I'm <laughs> really noticing the Spaz family this time around. I reckon last time that was my legitimate toilet break. I don't think I heard the Spaz family in the '90s at all. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. When once we once all the Spaz family has run its uh, time in the episodes, I will put them all together so we can see. <laughs> Exactly the life and adventures of the Spaz family. 
<laughs> it will give the Donahues a run for their money. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now we have commercial crime stoppers. And this one, oh, actually the transition between the Spaz family and commercial crime stoppers was very awkward. I think someone forgot to click the applause button a few times. Well, see, also the, the, the Spaz family part um, didn't last very long, which meant that um, it, it didn't give uh, Santo all the time to, uh, to get out of his uh, uh, Bailey suit and uh, go and join Mick. No. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but they were there to present the documentary of behind the scenes of Ken Bruce, of Ken Bruce has gone mad, and uh, it was pretty much a documentary, a la in bed with Madonna type thing. It's just amazing how they did all this <laughs> as commercial, a company, a brand on the ABC. They got away with murder. One, yeah, one thing that really creeped me out about this whole thing was I, you know. Getting, getting the actual episode and putting it on the big telly, I didn't realise how hairy Ken Bruce is. <laughs> yeah. It was like wool. And I was just like, oh, oh, oh. The whole time. <laughs> the original drag race. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Not as horrifying yeah. as some of those old washing machines. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because I remember Tony, uh, our Tony, not Tony Martin, uh, Champagne Comedy's Tony, was mentioning about the actual <clears throat> stall of Ken Bruce, saying that he remembers it being quite a bit of a shambles. You know, it looks like that half of it was concrete and half of the floor was basically dirt. And, yeah, I was trying <laughs> yes. to look for all the features and everything like that, just to any resemblance of how dodgy the floor was or anything like that. And I saw a few cracks and, you know, how it was just all narrow, slapped together, on the fly. And it was all it was was just that's how it was a discount thing. Sold stuff, cleared it out, put more in so he can make his cheap commercials. Yep. Yeah. Well, with the commercials, like he, you, see, you see Ken Bruce as a range of characters, like his crazy cousin Bert, he's Madonna, he's, um, he's an Egyptian kind of Cleopatra type Ken Bruce and there's a few other characters that he does including there's like a Norseman with like a Viking guy <laughs> like Big Horn, who, who looked quite a lot like that guy who invaded the US Capitol building. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> what you were not by. I just like the fact that, that he's done about five or six characters and, and they must have like just made all these commercials in like, you know, half a day or something. So he's he's making like six, maybe more commercials. And that's why and that's kind of why they're so crap, is because he he had like one take on each of them. He just had to pump them out. You know. Yeah. He just no, we're not gonna have a set. We're just gonna film it in this crappy warehouse, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's it's done cheaply. Yeah. My favourite line in it was, uh, oh, it's baby time. It's a closed set. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a baby character as well. Yeah. Madonna's wearing like an aerobics outfit with one of those kind of up the ass leotards that they had in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I just, oh. Oh, you mean the Christy Allen Lycra? That's the one, that, the, the up the ass type, yeah. I love the way his dresser comes in with socks to shove down the leotard. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't we go, or Santo goes, it's tip time or something. <laughs> <laughs> the next segment is Tommy G doing a routine live in the studio with the cure for boldness. So you can trust him because he's Ooh. wearing a white jacket, white science jacket, lab coat. <laughs> Uh, and now, using... you, you might you, you might not be able to see it on the web, but um, yeah, I'm, I might need to uh, to look closely at this uh, hair replacement system. <laughs> well, I, I, th- I think I think I'm, I might need it a bit on the top. Well, mate, yeah. you just, just need some foam. Yeah. Look back on your head. <laughs> live demonstration, guys. Live demonstration. <laughs> we'll just organise some rhinoceros semen for you, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, but did you notice that because while the three guys were there, uh, semi bald, uh, I believe the one on the far right, the one who gets the follicle foam on his head, is Michael Hirsch. Yeah, that's Michael yeah. Hirsch. Yeah, as yeah as as far as far as I can tell, it's yeah two uh, yeah two bald guys plucked out of the audience and Michael Hirsch, and I'm pretty sure all three of them did not know what they were in. For. <laughs> No. <laughs> you can tell from the reactions 
especially the reaction from Hershey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's like, oh, you're so dead. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, also, who knows they they don't put like a like a covering over their clothing. So so all this all this rhinoceros semen and, and other stuff that they <laughs> will just go straight onto their nice clothes. And and certainly the two blokes the two blokes who aren't Michael Hirsch they're probably going out to the pub after this. So you know, <laughs> <Not> <laughs> <you're now. going. laughs> then on top of the phone they get a nice little dose of hair clippings on top. Oh yeah, that, is that? that- on top, yeah. You're for baldness, just what looked like hair gel, like cheap hair gel, and yeah. and then putting some hair on top. That that works, right? <laughs> well, I think, I think science is sound. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a different thing. No, no, I, I tried. And how do they reference Michael Hirsch in the credits for this one? Ah. Ah. That's not yet, not yet. Wait for it. Not yet. <laughs> okay. I, I know what it is. Yeah. Can't ruin it yet. I, I like how uh, Tom ends the segment by saying that baldness is not a laughing matter and then points to all uh, three unsuspecting members there. Mind you, that's pretty piss funny, I guess. <laughs> <sighs> Mate, we will try it one day, okay? I'll get back to you because I'm starting to lose mine as well. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't forget to do the bit where you drill the hair in with an actual, like, drill. Yes. <laughs> that that. Key to the process. Yeah, I just got to make sure the person does it is wearing a white lab coat. That's the only way you can yeah. tell that they're legit. Yeah. Yep. yeah, I had to wear a white lab coat for something that I was being filmed for for, for my work just to make me look professional. <laughs> grab the white, grab the lab coat. It just makes you look like you know everything. <laughs> Did you just say to the camera, yes, it's definitely a clipboard? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> usually there is a clipboard as well. Yeah, if you bring that out. I've got one right here. <laughs> All right, the next sketch is over the top pest control. They have new equipment. Woo! The, the new equipment seems to consist of kind of small artillery, basically. Um, yeah, which, like bazookas. I, I guess I guess can get rid of snails and spiders, but but <laughs> as the name suggests, does seem a bit over the top. Don't they say at the end that they'll throw in uh, getting rid of your neighbour for free? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the unwanted neighbours. I'm sure a lot of people will be taking them up on that offer. Yeah, Laurie Donoher could have tried that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but, yeah this had Aaron Baker written all over it. It's like that they write that stuff just for him to blow shit up. <laughs> he, he is very good at, at creating explosions which are just slightly too big for what, what they need and, and consequently very funny. Yeah. Okay, and now we have Graham and the Colonel and... Here's a few things which they kind of look, the show is running short, so they're basically trying to pad out their whole seat. Yeah, stretch it out, stretch it out. We're all doing hand gestures to the camera there. Stretch it out. Yeah, the, stre- the stretch hand gesture. Yeah. yeah. So you have now Greg Norman winning the Canadian Golf Open. So which jacket did he win? It was either, and they listed all their golf jackets, the Australian Masters, yellow jacket. U.S. Masters, Green Jacket, and Canada Lumber Jacket. So, <laughs> yeah. There's a bit dumb tish there, oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm not as fast as your dad. Sorry, Danny. No, it's fine, Matt. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that means a lot. Uh, and the other news stories, they spin off into... Something else totally different, which would be the financial markets and the collapse of the pound. There you go, Alison. The fact that Graham and the Colonel were about to travel to the UK to cover a darts tournament. (laughs) That that brought a good laugh, didn't it? uh, But they were warned not to get travellers checks and pounds, but they got the Yugoslavian dino instead. (laughs) Yeah, but the checks were written with crayons, so they're not 100% sure. Yeah, They're probably still worth more than the actual (laughs) currency. Yeah. The clever currency, they called it. The US Open Tennis, and Graham was chatting to Ted Tingley a while ago, uh, the late Ted Tingley, and discussing the ball board job. Now, this is, one is a funny one with yeah. a lot of uh, people who... You know, we get this tweeted a fair bit during the US Open uh, on uh, our Twitter account, which is TLS Champagne, um, because there's... Four or six, sorry, five or six ball boys uh, when one job can be done by one cocker spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> My mum has a cocker spaniel and he would be great at it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Now, who wants to do the line here? Who who wants to do the, the comedy line here? Okay, oh. doggy, doggy, give me oh. the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me the ball. <laughs> Did you notice there was a little um, late show mini tragedy here, though? Because, like, when they're acting, trying to, like, Rob's trying to get the ball from Santo <laughs> as a Cocker Spaniel, the chair tips up and then lands on Santo's foot. Did you notice that? And no. it's really obviously agony for Santo. Mm. Mm. I never paid attention to him. Did he flinch? Did he? Oh, yeah, he, he, he was, yeah, he was, yeah, was freaking out. Ah, yeah, I must have been writing. In, I was probably writing the notes for this <laughs> <laughs> when I looked away. Damn it! I've got to check it out again. I mean, it was good humid pain, but you could tell it really killed him. It was like, <laughs> 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 yeah, he was rubbing it. And... Wow! Oh, so um, live TV. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's perfect live TV. <laughs> That's champagne comedy. Ah, uh, so they were not going to the snow this year as well. Uh, they always have car issues. The car breaks down constantly because the colonel keeps topping up the car with antifreeze in the petrol tank, which naturally doesn't go there. That was a weird one. It was, that was a weird joke. But it got some laughs. But they were flummoxed, so we got a flummoxed in there. Yay. For the day. Yay. Good old flummoxed. Bring out the whiteboard. Yep. <laughs> and uh, there's a new board game in Leslie's Woolworths game where you have to guess the location that Ian is doing the ad from. I the, 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 the stupid location. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a vague memory of these ads. I, I remember like he, he was in the Sydney cricket ground during one of the <laughs> or, or like on the Harbour Bridge or something. I don't know. They were they were really odd locations and he would say, you know, if if we if we put together all the apples that Woolworth sells in a week, they would fill this stadium. It would be that kind of bullshit, wouldn't it? You know. Well, well, see, see I, I can I can shed a little bit of light on this. Um, unfortunately, I, I haven't seen any of the actual television ads, but in going through all of the newspapers on microfilm, I did come across a few print ads. Um, and, yeah, they're for Woolworths Limited as a whole, um, as opposed to just the supermarkets. Um, yeah. I think it might have been because I'm not sure how much it's, it's related to they floated on the stock exchange mid-1993. Um, so I think be it, it might have been related to that. I'm not quite sure, given the timing. Yeah, um, you just look up his biography. They talk about how he was the face of the public share float, and yeah, I, that was probably what it was. But I don't recall any of the ads. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, well, see, these are a few of the, the print versions. So, uh, one of them says, "If Woolworths employees and their families lived in one place, it would be a city larger than Hobart." Who doesn't love statistics-based advertising? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the, the era of the kind of mum and dad shareholders and they're trying to really appeal yeah. to a broad base there and, and, yeah. and have the language there that kind of, that people can kind of relate to. And then another one I found, uh, Woolworth, uh, Woolworth we sells enough uh, fresh produce in one year to fill a bowl the size of the MCG. Um, I'm surprised wow. that they didn't use uh, Olympic swimming pools as a measure of anything like this. <laughs> mm. yeah. So I was kind of right there with my thing with apples, yeah. Well, wow, you know what? That, that's so weird seeing that because you think uh, that, you know, a credible journalist promoting a product like that, it'll do some damage to their cred. But it's just like, say, you know, years later with Steve Liebman hosting that McDonald's Gets Grilled documentary. Oh, and, yes. And you think, yep, they're all in the same boat. But yeah, they, they, yeah they, especially they, they're they, on they, Channel they were, 9. Yeah, they were, they were very odd ads because. Um, yeah, they weren't. They weren't really selling anything. Like there wasn't any sort of call to action at the end. It was just, you know, saying how good Woolworths is for no real reason. To talk up how the value of it, really. Yeah, yeah. just to appeal to the potential buyers. Brand awareness would be aim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely uh, tweet those ads out. And uh, so Graham and Kendall wraps up, and we have the closing and more Bert Newton. Uh, gallery stuff so which <laughs> it, very very artistic viewers that's for sure <laughs> uh, the Bertles that was fantastic oh, I love the Bertles so good and uh, well that's the only one that I paid attention to anyway so <laughs> the, good on the, yeah the elephant's bum yeah <laughs> <laughs> Danny's lost it <laughs> <laughs> Why, why would you spend hours drawing Bert Newton on an elephant's bum? I know. Personally, they're all in the National Gallery now. So it was yeah. Yeah. Still. 
we still got to, you know, uh, someone's still got to give us a copy of the uh, Burt Newton fan newsletter. The one that's at... Uh, You've got to go to that library. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was from the previous episode, Danny. Right. Uh, yeah, there was an actual fan newsletter, like a physically printed e-zine type thing. I am yeah. not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and they also have uh, Worst Album Covers. So they actually had a decent entry uh, for Worst Album Covers this time. Uh, you have the – now I apologise for this. I even wrote it out phonetically so I couldn't screw it up. The Happy Turolean Wanderers. Uh, Turolean. Turolean, there we go. Hooray. Turolean, yep. I'm hopeless at that. Uh, with the snow-capped music down under. <laughs> we got to check these to make sure that they're on Spotify. If not, they need to be. Uh, look, Mum, no hands. It's Mrs. Mills. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's, there's a fair bit of Mrs. Mills on Spotify. I I do know that because oh. she her act was essentially singing badly. <laughs> Spotify worthy then, and we yeah. oh, and now this one is more or less a typical Tommy G joke, tasteless and. Uh, 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 I, I think the words you're looking for are a product of its time, Matt. Yes, if only I had the sting. Jeez. No. Um, <laughs> the product of its time, Mr. Baldy, uh, a.k.a. Brian Keith Jones, who is a very, very naughty person. I'm just saying Google it, but make sure you clear your cache afterwards. Yes. Going back to prison. <laughs> and so Tommy shows uh, the album by Jamie Redfern sitting on top of the world with Liberace in the background. That's all I'm saying. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It was one of oh, those. My God, my God the, 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 that's so inappropriate from the audience. Yeah. But he yeah. delivered it. He delivered it. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> thank, thank God that was the joke of the show. I think that's about as late as you would want it. You, you would not be at the front of the show. No, of course not, no. No. Uh, but that's pretty much the end of it. Then you had the closing credits. And Daniel, please tell me what you've noticed in the closing credits. Oh, yes. Uh, Shirty's personal trainer, Michael Hirsch. Mm. 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 So, so he's taking he's the nunchucks. That's good to know. Yeah. Well, he could be. Actually, I mean, really, I don't reckon anybody. that's Michael Hirsch that's dirty, though. I reckon that's Rob. Oh there's yeah, too much. There's too much acting in that in those uh, scenes. <laughs> so yeah, very. very so, really, it, could, it, it, it could be anyone behind that uh, head. Yeah. Just, uh, just like it, it could be anybody in that cash, cash cow suit. All right, and then we also had the audience tickets at the very end with Graham and the Colonel playing the Ian Leslie board game intertwining that with, you know, the audience number. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, they just couldn't let that one go, could they? That pretty much wraps up uh, episode 10 of season one of The Late Show. What would you give that, uh, Danny, out of Eurovision scores? I think an ace. An eight. Yeah, there was there were little Easter eggs in there, but you know it wasn't it wasn't Sweden. It was kind of <laughs> middle of the road. But no, there were definitely some good Easter eggs in this one. It needed more bell bottoms and blue jeans. It needed more cowbell or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, some some so, some pretty solid stuff there, but I would say maybe the news desk probably knocks a point or two off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Since uh, that's the end of that uh, show, we do have some more podcast news stuff. So your yeah, entries to the best quote that you can do, I'll do a quick run through. Danny, you're probably hearing this for the first time. Trying to get people to record their favourite quote or impression of the late show and send it oh, through, cool. and then we can... Uh, enter and win uh, some dodgy prize pack that we're just building randomly. So, but we do have one product which is an unopened DVD of any questions for Ben, which is now worth more than what I paid for in the first place because uh, <laughs> apparently it's discontinued. So, uh, but oh, yeah, right. Nice. Here the entrance again. So you have Lance. I made love to her like a tiger, like a tiger. Sebastian. Uh, good day from uh, Dominic. How are you? No, miss. Mister. Peach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, do you believe in mental telepathy? No, I hear you think. And Dan. You can say what you want about me. I may be <laughs> ugly, but at least I'll never be as ugly as an angular web. 
So send your entries through. Oh, one more. No. Thank you very much. Welcome to the late show. Oh, I won't play that whole thing. That was Kim. <laughs> Kim that was and- me in uh, 1994. <laughs> As a teenager, my friend. Sorry about uh, that. But Danny, have you got any favourite ones that you used to recite? Oh, on the spot again. Look, the beauty of this show is that some of the quotes that end up as vernacular and then you forget what the official source was. And it's not until you go back and watch these and you're like, oh, is that where I got it from? <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, listening to Like a Tiger, oh, I was nearly on the floor with that one. <laughs> Cause, it yeah, would be nice like if someone could, could do an okay doggy give me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> That, that 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 really lends itself to to this competition, I think. Oh yes, very much. Oh yeah, there's just there's just so many, and, and looking back, you just think, oh, that's right. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. quite ingrained, I think. Well, mm-hmm. whenever you feel like you're more than happy to uh, send to <laughs> send your entry to <laughs> champagnelateshow at gmail dot com, all you have to do is record it any way possible. Uh, prefer audio on your phone and send it through and we'll get it and we'll play it on the podcast. We've still got like, now we have 30 episodes to go really, 10 episodes left of season one and then another, yeah, we're doing season two as well, so not to forget that. Um, so, yeah, and you can also check out our website, champagnecomedy.com. Hit up the forum, which it kind of blips occasionally with a heartbeat, depending on <laughs> what goes on or so forth. And also hit us up on the Facebook page, which is The Late Show. You'll see it with the rotating profile image of whatever's going on at the time in the world. Currently, there is the guy with the bum with the fist coming out of it guy. <laughs> Sorry, that's the flag, yeah, the Australian yeah, flag. Happy day, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, ju- yeah that's, which is facebook.com, champagne comedy. Um, so, uh, and I just got one more th- Thing. I just want to have a shout out to Spencer Housen, who has just started, who, who was a guest on episode three, and he's now on 4BC Weekends, and he started um, recently. So, mm. hey, Spencer, he occasionally listens to this show when he's bored. So, <laughs> what well, was it? Uh, was it because of this podcast? <laughs> oh, it wasn't not because of this podcast. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're having to take whatever credit. Yep. Ah. Uh, but other than that, um, yeah, that pretty much wraps up uh, this episode, episode 10 of the Champagne Comedy Podcast. Danny, thank you so much. Thank you. It was yeah. great fun. I'm sorry for wasting hey, so many hours yeah. of your time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so what are your podcasts? And, uh, yeah, plug away what you're doing. Oh, okay. Uh, you can find uh, the podcast I do with my partner, Mark. It's called Win Machine Podcast. We're on all of the socials. And our website is winmachinepodcast.com. Uh, we're on majority of the uh, podcasty doohickeys. Uh, yeah, Apple, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Brushes. Um, our, yeah, our next yeah. episode will be going back to 2009 of the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, spoiler alert, Norway wins. And, uh, yeah, so um, we look at the um, the actual contest. We pick our top ten songs of the year based on a jury of two. And we also look back at the current events of that year and what happened in entertainment. So it's actually quite weird when you do a few that are – we've only really got uh, three episodes left of this season, which has been the last 20 years, and then we're going back to the 90s for season three. But it's quite weird when you're recording a podcast in 2021 and you look back at 2009 and you're like, wow, things have changed. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, so you can find us on all the bits, but we've still got to watch um, all three of the uh, of the contests for 2009. So, yeah, but it's it's all good fun. I will say one thing to take it back into the D-Gen working dog. Have you seen Santo Chilero look alike uh, as Lad? Oh, yes. <laughs> so what do you think about supersonic electronic as well as I am the anti-pope? <laughs> <laughs> Could definitely make it to Euro Club, I think. 
Fantastic. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening as well. Keep us subscribed uh, on all the podcast platforms. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Or if you give us a one-star, yeah, whatever. Don't care. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just call you a water key. I just wanted to have an excuse to press that button, that's all. Uh, please give us a five-star rating and we would really appreciate it. And, yeah, so thank you again. And uh, thank you, Alison, Prue, Kim, Daniel. Appreciate you guys coming back for another season or another episode, really, for 2021. And, yeah, thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Thanks. All, all right, I'm Matt and this has been the Champagne Comedy Podcast. Thank you for listening. Catch you next episode. Show ten, anything can happen. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Champagne Comedy Podcast, created by fans for the fans. For more information on this podcast, please visit champagnecomedy.com. Produced by Matt Fulton Productions, mattfulton.com.au.